Hello, my name is Carl Lloyd Hauser. I am the senior pastor of Grace Community Church, and I am so excited that you are with us on this podcast. We also want you to get connected in a church family. If you don't have a local church, check us out at gracemontrose.org. We want to make sure that you have an opportunity to grow and connect with God. But we pray that these next 25, 30 minutes that you spend with us are powerful, that God meets you and speaks to you because he loves you so much. So I, I don't know if you've seen, but um, Colorado is like going crazy for chickens right now. Have you seen that? So eggs are insane. My daughter was saying in Fort Collins, it's like uh, eight or nine dollars a dozen to get uh, some eggs up there. And uh, you may know that part of that is because uh, we have a new law now that all eggs in Colorado have to be cage-free uh, eggs. So that they have to come from cage-free chickens. And so that's put a little bind on things. So, you know, my family's jumping in. We're like, well, should we get a chicken coop and then let's get some chickens and all this? And I know how it'll work. It, it, by the time we decide and by the time we get our act together, I mean, we'll have our chickens. And as soon as they start going, the prices will level out and it'll all be back to normal. That's how it works for the Lloyd Housers. So we're, we'll be doing that, or I don't know if we're going to do it, but we, no, it's not the first time we've gone crazy. You know, we've gone crazy for toilet paper, remember that? And we've gone crazy for uh, lumber and crazy for computer chips. Uh, we were crazy for truck drivers for a little while there. Uh, baby formula, right? Medicines, all sorts of things. And, and I don't know what's next, but I'll tell you something is, there's going to be something else that we're like all just kind of freak out and go crazy about. And the world, see, here's, this is how I know, because the world is going crazy about everything right now. Now, back in June, I started praying for this moment. I actually started praying, Lord, where are we going as a church in 2023? And Lord, what would you have me focus on? What, you know, what, what is your vision for us? What's the word? What, what, what's the theme for us for this year? And we prayed uh, for months on that. And then October started to solidify. And the elders came together. And we came to this moment here. That while the world, in 2023, while the world is going crazy over everything, you and I, what we are going to do is stay focused on Jesus. We're just going to look at Jesus. That's the theme for the year is just focused focus on Jesus. So you could go buy chickens or do whatever you need to do, but in the midst of it, we just keep our eyes right on Christ. And they're going to rage, and they're going to go crazy, and we're going to be okay, because our eyes are going to be on our Lord. And I want you to understand that, that the enemy right now, he wants to distract you so he can rob you. He wants to distract you so he can rob you. I found uh, he's uh, known as the uh, world's greatest uh, pickpocket, Apollo Robbins. And I found this little video here. And I just want you to see how he distracts people to get their stuff. Let's check it out. I have a game for you, Eileen. It's a little bit of money, just like in the casinos. Yeah. Except this one has a good return on your investment. Squeeze it really tight. See, if I steal it from you, and I give it back. It's something of mine, so it belongs to me. You don't have to worry about losing it. Would you be impressed if I could take it out of your hand? Yeah, very. Yes, sweet. Yeah, hugely. Open your hand. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that slow. Okay. If you would, as you're doing this, yeah. hold on to my wrist, but squeeze. Squeeze tight. Watch it go. Don't watch the other hand, because if you do, it's going to look like it goes away. Did you see it go? See, while you're watching the hand, Eileen, it's actually sitting on your shoulder. Look on your shoulder. No, we should do it again. Hold your hand high. Watch the coin close. You right. can see it. It goes straight back to your shoulder again. We're going to keep doing it until she catches it. Well, You'll catch it, I'm sure. Put it in your hand. Wrap your fingers around it. Squeeze it tight. You got it? Don't yes. pull my finger. That's a different trick. I've seen that one before. It's back on your shoulder. The other shoulder. Not yet. It's going to be. No, All right, just a second. Open up your hand all the way. Is it still there? It's silver, 1964. You know, she's got two type of grip when it comes to money. You might have to use their hands if that's okay. Can I use your hand like this? Just hold it out flat. This is going to be like a team effort. If you would, just close your hand very tightly. Put your other hand on top, just like this. Watch it close. Put your hand right here. Now, come in closer. You can see this. You'll like the piece. It goes right through the back of the hand. Not here, not here. Open your hand. It's back on the shoulder. <laughs> it's just, that's funny. It's here. See, it appears in the air. Falls right back in the hand. Just see it go. We'll send it back up. There's a little bird flying by. Watch it go. Straight back up. Or if I did it real slow, you would see it go. Not here, ladies. Right now, it's touching your bare skin somewhere on your body. It's underneath the face of your watch. 
How strange. We'll do that again if you do it. Close your hand tight. We'll do that again. Watch. Back under the watch. Oh, Not under your watch, under her watch. But your watch is over oh, here no, with her watch. Oh, <laughs> Sorry about that, ladies. I... Now, the enemy, he wants to rob you blind, and he doesn't want to take your eggs, and he doesn't want to take your watch, and he doesn't want to take your stuff. But there's three things that the enemy wants to, de- to rob you of, and he's going to distract you so you lose them. And one is your purpose. The next is your joy, and the third one is your power. And he wants you to look over here, go over there, so he can just rob you blind in the middle of it. Let me show you our passage here. So open up uh, your Bibles, if you will, and this is really our theme passage for the year. It's in Hebrews 12, and we're going to start in verse 1, the second half of that verse. And I want to just, uh, I I encourage you outside of this time to spend some time here in Hebrews 12 and and just meditate and think and pray on this. But the author of Hebrews tells us in verse 1, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, if we're going to run a race and see God has a race for you, he has a purpose for you and a call for you. And if you're going to run, you have to look ahead. You don't look this way. You don't look that way. You certainly don't look behind you. You look forward at Jesus so you could run this race that he has marked out for you. There is a race that he has called you to. And in the middle of that, here it is. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. In the midst of everything, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and you will not lose heart. So we see here in this passage that Jesus is the object of our focus. He is the one that we focus on, but he is also the example of our focus, that he shows us how to focus. And he had this laser beam focus on his mission, on his purpose, which of course is the cross. Now, if we just go over to Matthew real quick, and you go to Matthew 16, we see the enemy trying to pull him off of his focus and trying to pull him off of his purpose. So Matthew 16, 21, it says, and from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples, I mean, just telling them plainly that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. Can you imagine? That's my purpose. I know I have to go forward to be killed, and on the third day, be raised to life. Here comes the distraction. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Can you imagine the Lord saying that to you? Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but you have in mind the things of men. So Peter presents a distraction to take Jesus off of his purpose. And it is the words of Satan for him, and it's the words of Satan for you. Let's do this another way. You can be our savior, but you don't have to have the sacrifice. Same thing comes to us. You can have the kingdom, and you can have it right now on earth. You don't have to wait till the very end. Take it right now. You don't have to go through all this pain, and you can have what God wants, but you could do it a different way. And that is the exact same thing that Satan will come to you and do. See, God will give you a purpose. He'll give you a direction. He'll give you a call. He'll give you a mission. And Satan will say, you can have this another way. You can have what God wants, but you don't have to do it his way. If God, if God calls you, if, he, if he's giving you a task, if he's giving you a burden, if there is something that you know that God is bringing you towards, expect Satan to give you an alternative. Expect him to come and say, there's a different way to do this. Expect him to bring discouragement against the call that God puts on your life expect disappointment you know whenever gina and i launch a new small group leader we just like we start praying for their marriage it's like look out this is gonna be a rough week for them because here they go and we see this discouragement coming up against our call all the time you know i I, i'll people will you know carl you know i emailed you three years ago about leading a mission to japan and you didn't return my email so i forget it 
Or, you know, I, I get a note, well, I, I texted Eric in 2018 about playing the xylophone, and he never, he never texted me back. I'm like, can you blame him, first of all? <laughs> and now listen, it's, Eric should text you back, right? And I should email you back. I mean, this is my job, is to equip you for works of service that you're called to do in advance, right? I, I should do that, and if I didn't, I'm sorry. But, but here's the thing. Did Eric call you to worship? Did I call you to lead a mission trip? Or did God? And if God is the one who called you to the ministry, all it, all it takes to pull you off of the call from God is one unreturned email? That's enough to dissuade you? One non-response from Eric is enough to take you off of your call right there? Now, we need to follow up, okay? We, and if I didn't, I'm sorry. I need to get better at that. That is so important. But come on, who called you? You know, you're supposed to lead a Bible study, right? And, and one group launch where nobody showed up, you're done? That's all it took to kill the call of God on your life? Or, or you led a group and there was somebody in there who they took it off track or, you know, they complained or they criticized about you, so it's over? I'll tell you what, you know, if, if I stopped with criticism, I'd have to quit just about every single week. You got to keep going, right? Let me, let me, let me explain something. Christians, listen. We need to get our spiritual grit back. We need to get spiritually gritty. I don't know what, what happened to us, but we get discouraged and we quit so easily. Get pulled off mission from the tiniest things. And it's time now that we get our eyes off of the results and off the distractions and off our disappointments and off of our, dis our expectations and put our eyes back on Jesus. He has called me. What's going to stop me? He's directing me. Do you think one of your little criticisms or your, your Satan coming up against there and saying, oh, really, and accusing me is going to stop me from doing what the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has put on my heart to do? Jesus has plenty of reason to quit. You know, he's got like 5,000, probably 10,000 people following him. One sermon, boom, it's down to 12. I mean, that would be discouraging. He's got disciples not getting it. You know, they go up to the transfiguration and, and Peter's like, hey, let's build some shelters. They're like, Peter, you don't understand anything that's going on right now. He's got the, the Pharisees coming after him, trying to trap him so he goes to jail against his ministry. We got people chasing after miracles and chase, chasing after bread and forgetting the miracle maker. All these threats. He has all sorts of reasons to quit. And it says, but the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning his shame, and nothing, not even hell itself, will stop him from completing the call and will that God has on his life. And is it the same way with you? I was listening to uh, Chuck Swindoll. I love Chuck Swindoll, one of my favorite all-time preachers. And he brought up this story. I'll just read it to you. And it says, on the first day of SEAL training, William McRaven and 150 other students stood at attention. The main instructor offered some initial words. Today is the first day of SEAL training. For the next six months, you will undergo the toughest course of instruction in the United States military. Apprehension was visible on the faces of the new trainees. The instructor also added, you will be tested like no time in your life, and that most of you will not make it through, and I will see to that. In full view of the new tadpoles was a brass bell hanging in the large asphalt courtyard. The instructor explained that to escape all the misery, all you have to do to quit is ring this bell three, three times. Ring the bell and you won't have to get up early. Ring the bell and you won't have to do the long runs, the cold swims, or the obstacle course. Ring the bell and you can avoid all this pain. But he also had another message. If you quit... You will regret it for the rest of your life. Quitting never makes anything easier. Out of all the lessons that McRaven learned in SEAL training, he said that this message was the most important. Life is hard, and there are forces that will try to break us down, but if we stand tall and strong against the odds, then life will be what we make of it, and we have the power to make it great. No matter what happens, never, ever, ever ring the bell. Christians, we need some spiritual grit. If God has called you, you go. If God has called you, nothing short, including hell, can stop you from moving forward to what he has for you. 
So I want you to understand that the enemy wants to distract you and rob your purpose. We've got to put our eyes on Jesus. But not only does he want to rob your purpose, he wants to rob your joy. Let's look at our passage here. Going back again, we'll go to the next verses here in Hebrews. So picking up where we left off in verse 4. The author of Hebrews tells us, In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves. He punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons for what son is not disciplined by his father? You have not resisted to the point of shedding blood. You know what he's saying? You can give up after you die. You've seen that in the coffee shops. We can sleep after we're dead, right? We can give up after we're dead. And here we, the very least, the very least that we can hope for, when you go through difficulty, we know at the very least, and God is doing so much more than the very least, that he is getting us prepared, and he's transforming us, and he's refining, and he's disciplining us. This is great hope for me. That no matter how bad it is, in every what if that I could possibly face, in every fear that could possibly be out there, that apparently God felt I needed to go through it. Apparently, God decided that I actually, he had something for me in the middle of that difficulty. So what if my health turns? What if my job falls apart? What if the economy collapses? What does the scripture tell us? Endure hardship like discipline. If you're going to go through that stuff, and you're going to go through some of that stuff, you endure it like refining, like transformation. And so we say, okay, God, what are you doing? How are you working in me? Now, listen, God doesn't send evil, but he can allow me to go through any valley that he wants to. I could go through any darkness that he wants me to walk through for the sake of my, the transformation of my soul. See, we're getting ready for heaven. It's not about this place. You know, when uh, Peter was walking on the water, walking on the water, why did he sink? You remember? It says, when he saw the wind. When he saw the wind, when he saw the waves, he was afraid, so he started to sink. This year, 2023, expect some wind. Expect some waves. It's going to come, right? And you know what? There's going to be bigger problems than eggs that we're going to face. And we're going to see that there's more pressure against the gospel and more pressure against the word of God. I'm excited because you know what? The gospel is moving forward forcefully right now. God is moving powerfully. And so you better expect that there's going to be some resistance to the gospel right now. And there's going to be some more strange policies. I've been watching. These policies are weird. I'm like, what are we doing now, right? And there's going to be some strange approaches and there's going to be more moral confusion. But I am certain, I am 100% certain that God is telling us as a church, that God is telling me and he's telling you in the midst of all of it, focus on Jesus. We're just going to look at Jesus and the nations, they're going to rage around us and they're going to freak out around us and people are going to, they're going to just go lose their minds over cultural issues and politics and, and the things that happen, maybe more wars, I don't know what's going on, different things and you know what we're going to do? We're going to look at Jesus. And we're going to be okay. You know, I, I decided to do a search. I wanted to see, okay, well, that's eggs now. What are they forecasting that uh, we're going to be short on in the future? Do you know what the forecast is right now? Beer. <laughs> it's true that there's a shortage of CO2. So we need to run on the liquor stores right after church. Everybody just, <laughs> what are all these Christians doing in the liquor store, right? <laughs> I warned you. No, I'm, and you know what the other one was? I couldn't believe this. Sand. Seriously, you know sand is the second most used commodity after water in the world, and they're actually predicting that we're going to run out of sand. And I'm like thinking, hey, we don't have to worry. We have Utah. We'll just, <laughs> we're set right here with sand. But that's what, but, so these things are going to happen, right? But here's the thing. Let them freak out. Okay, help them. Yeah, bring peace to them. But listen, don't join in. You can build a chicken coop if you want, but you don't have to worry. Remember what we're doing here. We are getting ready for there. We're getting other people ready for there. That's what this is all about. It reminds me, we act like Peter after Jesus has been resurrected. 
and he's talking with Jesus. And, and Jesus tells him some hard words. He says, you know, when you're old, you're going to go places that they're going to take you places that you don't want to go. And, and they're going to they're bring you to, to things that you don't want to go to. And, and really what Jesus is telling him is that you're, you're going to die for me. And history tells us that Peter actually was crucified upside down. He made that choice because he, he didn't feel worthy to be crucified in the same way Christ was. But do you remember what Peter says? He says, well, what about John? That's going to happen to me. What's going to happen to, him, to happen to him? And what does Jesus say? What is that to you? What does it matter what happens to John? I'm talking about Peter right now. And, and, and you know, you've heard, you know, well, you do you, right? Well, I, I want to tell you this. You do you and Jesus. They're going to do whatever they want. You do you and Jesus. It's you and Jesus, you and Jesus, you and Jesus. They're going to go this way. Other ministries are going to do that thing. Other people are going to do that. Leaders are going to do this. You do you and Jesus. I've been on, uh, this week it's been a media fast for me. I have no idea what's going on in the world right now. And I am so much happier than I was last week. It's just better, right? Actually, I know what's probably going on. I'm sure some politicians are doing something that makes me really, really mad. You know, I'm sure that there's uh, uh, some sort of mayhem somewhere. You know, I mean, it's all the same. It just kind of comes up and it just wants to rob you of your joy. But we focus on Christ. Right after uh, 9-11, uh, U2, which I personally think is the best band in the world. John and I disagree on this. But, uh, and I think it was the best Super Bowl show, but they did the Super Bowl show. He would say Prince, I say Prince Schmintz. It was U2 who did the best one. And so uh, they had this uh, Super Bowl show right after 9-11. And it was, it was pretty powerful, I thought. And I like the band, okay? But, but part of it, uh, at the very beginning, they bring this big kind of sheet out and they put all the names of all the people who were uh, killed at, on 9-11. And then uh, Bono comes out and he starts singing this song, which I really, really like. It's called Beautiful Day. And he starts singing Beautiful Day. And I just, the reason I bring it up, I saw an article on this actually from Christianity Today. It was in, uh, I think, last week's issue. And Bono was talking about it. And he, he decided, he said, you know, the whole world was affected by 9-11. And the whole world was, was in mourning. And you know what he called that night when he sang Beautiful Day right in the midst of it? He said, I, I felt like I had to bring to the world, I love this, a night of, listen to this, a night of defiant joy. Isn't that good? Guys, that's us. As the world goes crazy right now, Listen, that's my protest. That's my protest against these crazy rules that, that they're making right now. That's my protest against the chaos of this world. That's my protest against sin and against brokenness, against the strategies of this world, against the corruption of this world. My protest, do you know what it is? It's not a raised hand. It's not a raised finger. It's a song of praise. My protest is defiant joy in the midst of it. Bring it. Though he slay me, I will praise him. Whatever you bring against me, I will lift up the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's my protest. What's your protest in this time? Exuberant, overwhelming, almost inexpressible joy in Jesus Christ. Church, listen to me, please. Please get this. In 2023, please focus on Jesus. Please get your eyes on Jesus. I'm telling you, it's going to make all the difference. You know, it's like those uh, movie heroes, you know, and it's time to face down the bad guy, and they're in the middle of the war, you know, and he sees the guy there, and, you know, they lock eyes, and, and they're just focused on there, and everybody else is like losing their arms and screaming and all this battle going on around. But he's like, nah, he's just zeroing in. I want you to look at Christ like that. People are screaming and freaking out. Things are falling apart. Chaos here, chaos there, and we're just moving forward into the race that he has set before us that we are called to go down. He's taking us through the season for a reason. And he has a life-giving, faithful, beautiful journey for you along the way. And you're not going to just survive it, you're going to thrive in the midst of it. What an exciting time to be a follower of Jesus Christ. But I got to tell you, you have to get your focus on the King of Kings. You have to be just zeroed in on the Lord of Lords. I mean, let the stuff that happens, let it happen. But as you do, you will enjoy the journey. You know, our prayer service that we had on New Year's Day, man, I had fun. Anybody enjoy that service? It was so good. Because God was moving, right? 
And I'll tell you, you know when I was there, you know what I didn't feel in the midst of God moving? Fear. I didn't feel anxiety. I wasn't unsettled. I didn't have any worry. You know what I had in the middle of God's presence? I was experiencing it just right here, or right over here as Eric was leading us. Peace. Excitement. Anticipation. Man, just enjoying the moment, enjoying him. The enemy wants to distract you and he wants to rob your joy. But not only does he want to take your joy, not only does he want to take your purpose, the enemy wants to take your power. And I want to give you just another warning here as we go in here. It's not just distractions that he's going to bring from crazy things. It's distractions he's going to bring to you from lesser things. And this is not a time, follower of Christ, this is not a time to kind of obey God. It's just not going to work. This is not a time to kind of follow Jesus. It is a time of focused obedience on Jesus until that obedience is absolutely complete. I want to show you this passage in 2 Kings. It's kind of an odd passage, but it's actually, I think, pretty beautiful and pretty amazing. 2 Kings 13. And so Israel right now is in, uh, it's a mess. Kingdom is divided. The king, Jehoash, he's like sort of trying to follow God, mostly not. Elisha the prophet, he's just about to die. And so Jehoash comes to Elisha, and in verse 15 of chapter 13 of 2 Kings, it says, Elisha said to the king, get a bow and some arrows. And he did. Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elijah puts his hands on the king's hands. And so that's saying, now this is from the Lord. This is what the prophet has to give to you here. Verse 17, open the east window, he said, and he opened it. Shoot, Elisha said, and he shot. Then he declares, the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram, Elisha declared. You will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphex. You're going to win. You're going you're to defeat your adversaries. That's what God is saying. And then Elisha said, now take the arrows, and the king took them. And Elisha told him, strike the ground. So he struck it three times, and he stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then he would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it, but now you'll defeat it only three times. And the first time I read it, I was just like, what's a big deal? I mean, he's trying to do what you tell them to do. But I think what we see here is that Jehoash, he had at least six arrows. And he only brought forward three. He only brought forward half of what God had given him. And what we see, and it's the rest of his life, we see that Jehoash is only half in. His heart is only half in in the work of God. He's only halfway obedient. He'll only sort of do what God says. And his eyes are moving to and fro, and they're kind of only half on God half of the time. The worst possible place to be right now is half in for Jesus. Do you know why? Because you're going to get all the persecution, you're going to get all the resistance with none of the joy and none of the power. Don't be half in. What God has for you is complete victory and complete power and he has a complete work. Philippians 1.6, it says, he who began a good work in you is faithful to bring it to completion. He's going to finish this thing. And if there was ever a time, if there was ever a time to be all in, it is right now. At this, we are in an amazing moment in history, an exciting moment in history. If there was ever a time to be kingdom people, it is right now. If there's ever a time to be advancing the kingdom of God, it's right now. If there's ever a time to have your eyes fixed on the kingdom and real kingdom living, it is right now. And you know what? I tell you what, I can see it. It's beautiful what God has for us right now. He is going to bring us back to an Acts 2 church. I can see it. I've seen glimpses of it right here. It's so beautiful. And I can taste it. Have you tasted it? The presence of God, the work of God, where church could be what it actually was meant to be. Don't you see it rising in our midst right now? Don't you feel it coming? That God is bringing a new thing and a powerful thing where we are praying together and we are unified together and we are serving together and we're connecting together and we're growing together and multiplying together and, and we're rejoicing in our suffering together. And while the world rages and it wrings its hands and it freaks out, the church, us, you and I together, we are just living like he had in mind. We are being the church with our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, seeing him move powerfully in our midst. 
What an amazing time to be alive. Yeah, praise God. But listen, it comes with complete, gritty, gritty, determined obedience. With complete, unwavering focus on the King of Kings. Making Him our pursuit and our reason. It comes with focusing him at all time on him at all times in all things. It comes with our decision that we will bring defiant joy. You're not going to touch my joy. And I defy the world and its ways and its stumbling and its sin to say, no, I praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And whatever you want to bring against me, I will say, no, no, it is well with my soul because I know who he is. I know who I am in him. Bring what this world will. The Lord will take me through whatever he wants to. It is well with my soul. He's my king. He's my Lord. He's my savior. He's my great pursuit. Thank you, God, that it is well. Fix your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for being with us. I hope that God spoke to you. We would love to follow up and care for you any way that we can. So come visit us at gracemontrose.org. Say hello. Let us know what we can do to help you grow in Him. God bless you.